Um, there's a couple of neat things that were done in the Smalltalk system just by virtue of making things into objects. For instance, Smalltalk has an object called a context, which is uh, it's like an active object that corresponds to stack frames as the language itself is running. And if you can actually send messages to these stack frames, then you can take the frozen state of a computation held onto by the debugger and in perfectly high-level language uh, code, go through and single step your program or read out temporary variables. And it makes the writing of a debugger a much simpler problem than in a language in which you can't do that. One last thing I think is worth mentioning is in a true object-oriented system, if <clears throat> you send a message to an object which isn't understood, then it will go through the inheritance hierarchy trying to find a meaning for that message that you sent. And ultimately, it will terminate at the end of that uh, tree without any definition. And that is typically an error. Now, what's usually done is that there's, or at least what's done in the Smalltalk system, is there's a way of catching that situation and turning it around so that if you've sent some message foo to an object, and it isn't understood anywhere in the inheritance hierarchy, then the system itself, the interpreter or whatever you've got, uh, turns it around and bundles that message up, the name foo, as an object called a message, and presents it to the original receiver of the, ob uh, of the message as the argument of a message that is message not understood. In other words, when everything else has failed, the, the original object will, will receive a message that says, I didn't understand this message, and its name was foo. And it will also have these arguments if it had arguments. And at that point, then, up in class object, there can be code for when a message is not understood that invokes a debugger. So that's how you handle simple errors of a message being sent that isn't understood. But there are other more powerful things you can do. For instance, if you have a file that's not open for which it wouldn't make any sense to respond to most messages, you can change it into a kind of object that doesn't understand those messages. And then when those messages are sent, it has a chance to discover that, reopen itself, change, it, change itself into a proper file, and then do the, uh, do the operation and carry on. Or an even more powerful use of this would be you can have objects in the system which aren't even in your computer. They might be on somebody else's computer over a communication network. And if you send a message to them, they get a chance to look at the message, see what it is, and they might actually dial the, cause the telephone to be dialed and a message to be sent over the phone, the response come back, and then respond. So this, this is really all a manifestation of what I said, the simulation property as long as you have this very tight control over how things can be accessed, objects can simulate all sorts of behavior. Well, thanks. That concludes most of the major issues about object-oriented programming and several of the uh, details of the Smalltalk system. I'll next be talking with Dave Ungar about some of the questions that uh, people ask most frequently about object-oriented programming. Well, Dan, after that nice, clear explanation of object-oriented programming, it sounds like just the thing to use for building these complicated systems. But I think a lot of people are going to be afraid of the efficiency of it. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I don't think of it as a big issue, obviously, because I've been using it for the last 15 years. But uh, it's a reasonable question to ask. My first thought about it is machines are always going to run faster and faster. And somewhere in there, it makes sense to go with the language that works best and let the hardware take care of the speed. Um, it's still an interesting question to ask, why is it slower and how much slower does it have to be? Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a lot of great energy that's been applied to making message sending go fast. Uh -huh. it used to, the Smalltalk system used to be, I think, 200 times slower than other things comparable. And sure. most of the, implementa the decent implementations now run between 10 and 5 times slower than something like C. Uh -huh. And uh, so I don't see that as a big problem. People say that automatic storage management takes a long time. But uh, 
It's something like 10%, and I think in your gar what scavenger, generation, scavenger, you're like down around 3% at right. the time. And plus, there's another factor in there, which is if you don't have it, you have to have explicit code in there. At least if it's, if it's written into the language, then it all happens in the most optimum possible way in a decent implementation. So I think it's just that you know, the future is more efficient, and it's the question of when you want to reap the fruits. And I think now is the right time. Well, uh, I certainly agree. Now, some researchers, in an attempt to uh, make things go faster or to just uh, simplify uh, their lives, have left certain things out uh, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, even an attempt to come up with new languages. So, for instance, there are a lot of ingredients in what uh, you talked about. There were abstract data types, there were classes, message passing, uh, blocks, inheritance, uh, and one thing uh, you didn't mention, which were type declarations. So mm -hmm. of the ones that were in there in small talk, which ones do you think uh, were really essential? And uh, also, what would you feel about uh, type declarations, which was one feature that's not in small talk? Boy, OK. You mean, the thing that I think is most essential is message sending, because that's what gives you this <coughs> this uh, interface that ensures that you can simulate. And that's what all the real power comes from. So that, that's the thing that hides uh, how an object does something from how you ask it to do something. From the request of what to do to the implementation of how to do it. That's right. I see. And uh, now, I think inheritance is also really important because the, it's in, inheritance is together with the polymorphism, uh -huh. uh, gives you the reusability. And that's what's making object-oriented programming so successful. Uh -huh. um, now, you can, I don't think that classes are essential. And you must feel the same way, because you've done this language self that's based on prototypes. Sure. Uh, and you get uh, all the same advantages. It's just a different view of the world. Sure, and, and some more flexibility. Now, uh, something in both self and small talk is that everything is an object. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, one of the easy roads to efficiency is when you have simple things not be objects. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about uh, that sort of path? Well, I think that that gets you into problems. Uh, this example that I gave of being able to define your own class of numbers, use them in the existing class of rectangles, and having the operating uh -huh. system black in a rectangle, I don't think will work if you have that kind of a situation. In other words, if you have numbers and rectangles that are built into the system as primitive objects, it won't work. So it's not only that message passing is essential to have, it's essential to have for every kind of data in the system. That's right. Yep. I, yep. I see. I see. Well, there are uh, other features in small talk, uh, and I guess self, that are not in some of these uh, other languages, like blocks, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is I there some... Is there some connection between blocks and the object-oriented programming? Well, if blocks, is, I didn't say anything about blocks, but blocks are where you, they're like Lisp lam, lambda expressions, sort of. They're where you can pass a piece of code uh, along as a parameter of a message. And then uh, blocks are like any other objects. They understand messages, and the most common ones are to evaluate yourself. Uh -huh. What it lets you do, what's uh, having an object-oriented framework lets you have blocks behave that way. Uh -huh. And having blocks that behave that way let you, lets you write your own program, your own control structures, which uh -huh. is very nice. So you can take a piece of code that, uh, say, gives you a little block that gives you the population of a city, and then you can take a collection of cities and ask it to, to collect up the populations of all of those. And it's very simple. So that uh, extends the, the power of objects to hide complexity by letting them even hide the way control works for certain situations. That's right. And yes, to hide it and also to give you control structures that are appropriate to the various universes you're implementing. That's right. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, well, what's the relationship between uh, abstract data types and object-oriented programming? Then I guess if you take away inheritance, do you just have abstract data types? Or could you connect this up to some of that work a little bit? Well, let's see. 